Welcome back to Bill Faith Unfiltered. Uh, we're jumping right in with my good friend, uh, tax mentor, uh, tax strategist, and expert for small businesses, medium businesses, the short-term rental space. He's just a fucking genius. Ryan Bakey. Ryan, how are you, buddy? Awesome. Thank you for the introduction. Yeah, you're welcome. That might have been the best one I've ever done for you. So, and look, if you guys are out there and you're listening, you're watching on YouTube, you need to go. You see his handle there, at Learn Like a CPA. I was fortunate enough to meet Ryan about three and a half years ago. And Ryan, even though he's just in my mastermind and we've worked together and just mentor me, I haven't even retained him and he saved me over seven figures in taxes in the last three years. And that's what we're going to talk about today, Ryan. I want to kind of put you on the hot seat and, uh, you know, we were on the inner circle coaching call last night and you did such a great job of answering questions about what we as entrepreneurs, business owners, W2s, real estate investors, whatever, we've got, what is it? I think it's like maybe about 47, 48 days until the end of the year. What can we do between now and when the, the clock strikes midnight on December 31st to get some tax benefits? Well, I think that's just the, the, the case, right? The, your report card for taxes is between January 1st and December 31st. So only things that you do during that year are going to affect what your report card looks like in April and whether or not you take it home and your mom beats you because you get bad grades, right? So That sounds like that's coming from personal experience. <laughs> <laughs> so you got to have a tutor. You got to have somebody that's going to help you and guide you and teach you the strategies that you need to know so that way you don't get a bad report card, right? And the first thing I would always start with people is proper bookkeeping. I mean, investors are missing out on thousands of dollars of deductions because they forget it even happened. Especially those doing big rehabs or remodels, $30,000, $50,000 of expenses. It's really easy to forget that you spent money on something if you don't have a proper record keeping system. Now, here's the playbook. Here's how to make sure that you never, ever miss an expense again. You have checks and balances. You have a bookkeeper. You have your own review and you have a CPA that reviews your books. You got three levels of checks and balances. You're gonna assign your, your attached to a bookkeeper. Hopefully it's not you. That's the first check and balance, right? They're blocking and tackling. You're reviewing your books, should be every month, but quarterly at worst. And you have a CPA that specializes in real estate that knows what expenses are there and what not. I mean, I see so many people that have properties in the Smoky Mountains, they have no pest control fees for expenses. I know you have bugs and I know you have bears in the Smoky Mountains and I know you're trying to get rid of them. So where's your pest control fees? These are the things that, you know, small fees here and there, but they add up for somebody that's got three or four properties. Too many people do not pay attention to those basics, Ryan. And I was one of them when I was your age, you know, when I started my entrepreneurial journey. And one thing that really resonated with me that I didn't do until we met was I started meeting with my CPA. I mean, like me and you and the super team and mastermind, we talk about this stuff all the time, but I didn't do real tax planning, right? And really, I think it was 21, late 21, early 22. I took what you said, what you just said to everybody out there. And one, me and Bria were still doing, Bria was doing, doing our own books. Now we have a bookkeeper uh, for the short-term rentals. And it's crazy because it's like the life plan versus the business plan, right? We all have business plans, but we don't put that shit together for our life. I wasn't treating my short-term rentals the exact same way I was treating my other businesses. But the one thing that changed for me is now I meet with John, my CPA we've had for 11 and a half years, every single quarter. And that has completely changed the tax strategy. I filed, I, I didn't, the other thing is I didn't used to file extensions. I was always afraid of getting audited. So I wanted, and the myth is if you file an extension, you would get audited. So now I filed an extension every single year to give me more time to be able to plan as well. Yeah, and I don't know the stats on that, but it's actually a uh, higher audit risk to file an inaccurate return on April 15th and then later figure out over the summer that you did it wrong and amend it. That's a bigger audit risk than just filing an extension because you don't have all your, your ducks in order and then filing on October 15th. Way, way higher audit risk that way. I mean, I just like... Please go back, hit the rewind button, go back two minutes and listen to what Ryan said about those three steps that you need to take to really keep your shit together. Because most, no, you know that, your new clients, they're not prepared that way. All my new students, my inner circle people, none of them are ready. They're just, for whatever reason, there's this mental hurdle, Ryan, that we don't treat this stuff like a real business. 
And that the tax planning quarterly alludes into what I was going to get into next, which is prepaying your estimated taxes. It used to be the IRS interest rate for late payments was only three or four percent. So it normally used to just keep up with inflation. I even did this at, in the first couple of years where I said, hey, the interest rate's only four percent, inflation's four percent. So I'm just going to pay them the interest on the tax deadline. It's the same amount of money. But the IRS just recently raised the interest rate all the way up to 8% uh, for 2024. And then it's going to be even higher in the future. And so if you're not prepaying into your taxes throughout the year, uh, you're going to have to pay not only the penalties, but also interest on top of that. And so planning for your tax bill, especially those that might, let's say you work a high W-2 job and you're doing co-hosting or you have Airbnbs on the side, you've got to be paying estimated tax payments on that income unless you have a good strategy in place to offset it. And Ryan, you have to pay 110% of minimum of what you paid in tax last year. So if you paid $100,000 in tax last year, you got to pay in 110 this year, right? That's now, right. I don't know the answer to this, but, and I don't think you have to do it by the end of the physical year, but I think you have to do it in 2020, the next year before you file your taxes. Is that correct? There's like a January or February. 15th, yeah. January 15th. Mm-hmm. So I mean, do you want to write a hundred thousand dollar check on January fifteenth, or do you want to start writing twenty five thousand dollar quarterly checks? Yeah, and there's so there's three ways to do estimated payments. This is what I teach people. Number one, you do absolutely nothing at all. You you just stick your head in the sand, and do nothing. Don't recommend that at all because you're going to be paying penalties and interest on top of what you already owe. Don't recommend that. The second thing is you can give the government enough money throughout the year. OK, so that way they don't come after you. That way they don't charge you ta- you know, penalties and interest. You give them that 110 percent throughout the year. OK, and then you pay whatever what, you pay, whatever the remaining balance is on April 15th. You're good. No ta- no penalties, no interest. Or the third option is you give them absolutely every single dollar that you're supposed to owe throughout the year. So that way, when you go to file your tax return, you just break even. They don't owe you money. You don't owe them money. And everybody lives happily ever after until next year, I guess. I kind of do it a combination of those last two. So I, we make quarterly payments every quarter. But then in those meetings, when I meet with John, my CPA, and we see, hey, I'm making more, making less. Like I just met with him for the second time this quarter already um, a few days ago. And I'm going to increase my income about, it looks like it's going to be like 40 to 43% this year over last year. And so he went through and he estimated and he's the one, so like you said, bookkeeper, then he audits every month. I know that's kind of a little crazy, but, and then Bree and I meet with him virtually to go over the P&Ls, like somewhere between the fifth to the 10th of every month to go over. So we know where we're at, but I was the guy that's like, hey, you know what? I've got a three-year-old Raptor. What if I come in and buy a brand new Raptor, right? What, what's my tax benefit gonna be for that? Cause he said, look, Bill, you probably need to pay an, another 85 to 110,000 bucks, hundred grand before the end of the year, just to be safe. And so the interesting thing is what you brought up last night, Ryan, was something that he had brought up to me as well, um, like about funding the, the, the solo 401k, which I think was really interesting. And I hope you were going to bring that up because I want to seed that for you, because uh, I think that's for somebody that's in like, that's making some decent money. I think that's most people just default to section 179 and let's go buy a 6,000 pound truck. But some of those tax codes have changed too, like bed length in a truck you know, impacts how much you can depreciate, right? I mean, there's some crazy shit. So what is your recommendations for that? You know what the busiest day of car dealerships is? December 31st. Because everybody's lined up and and their their, um, rational sense of price goes out the window. Why? Because all they care about is saving money on taxes. But you know what happens is when you go and buy that Raptor, you go and buy that car, your net worth immediately goes down as soon as you drive off the lot. And most people aren't paying cash for it, right? They're paying, they're, they're financing it, which, which is a cool tax strategy because you still get to deduct it in year one and you make the payments over time. But three, five years later, your net worth goes down by owning that car. You saved a bunch of money in year one, great, but your net worth three, five years later has gone down. And we like to recommend strategies that not it's only- It's like buying a fucking house for tax purposes and getting a dog that's losing $1,000 a month, right? That's right. Well, we like to, we like to recommend strategies that allow our clients to increase their net worth over time if they buy the right asset and they manage it right and save them money on taxes. And so that's why, I mean, if you're listening to this and you're going to be the one that just goes and buys a car at the end of the year, you might want to think about instead of setting up a solo 401k, 
or contributing to a retirement account because you're going to get the same tax deduction by contributing to a retirement account as you would buying a vehicle, you know, dollar for dollar. But your net worth after five years is going to go up, assuming that, uh, you know, it depends on the stock market wave that you catch. But I can guarantee you have a better chance of your retirement account going up in value compared to a car after five years. Agreed. 100%. Knowledge bomb drop. Mm -hmm. Slingshot, engage. You know, you're probably not funny. You don't get my, you didn't see Ricky Bobby? I mean, come on. Nah. But you've never seen the freaking Ricky Bobby Talladega Knights? I have not. I don't Ryan think so. Fucking Bakey, you better let's, watch that. Let's watch weekend. it. Let's watch it in Montana. It's it's like, <laughs> are, are you coming? I want to go. Yeah, it's like the greatest movie of all time. We will watch it in Montana. Okay. And if you don't like it, I'll pay for your airfare there and back. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and it, so what's cool about the Soul Four Hundred One K that we talked about yesterday is you just have to have the account open up by the thirty first. You get all the way into the tax deadline to contribute to it. That's awesome. And you said last night, uh, my solo 401k.com is an easy place for somebody. Do they just, do they need their CPA help or can they just go and set that up on their own and start funding it? You can set up a solo 401k by yourself. There's nothing that prevents you from doing that. You just have to know what, what the correct and proper amounts are to contribute to it. Right. And it's, and then it's based on the IRS requirements for 401ks. And it's also based on how much your business profits every year. Gotcha. And just find that, just Google that and find that in the tax code. Yeah, you could try to do it yourself or you can hire, hire somebody, somebody like you. Brian Bakey to help you with it. Calculate it. Yeah. Or, I mean, I talk a lot about it in my podcast. It's all free online. Everything's out there. I agree. All right. What's next? What else can I do? So the third thing we were talking about is, and this is what I try to do with all my properties is I try to look out uh, three to four months the first three or four months of the next year and see what I need for my property. So I try to do new paint, you know, uh, 36 and below that you call it, right? Like I try to, I try to get those supplies, linens, toiletries, K cups, all the stuff that I know that I'm going to need in the next four months. And I try to, I try to pay for it before the end of the year. Now what's cool about that is you can pay for it in cash. Or you could also put it on a business credit card. It's still the same deduction, right? So as long as you're paying for that before the end of the year and it's uh, put, you know, delivered to the property, well, then it's considered placed into service and you get to take the deduction this year. So it's just a really cool hack. The only time I don't think I would ever do that is if, let's say this year you were in a super low tax bracket because somebody lost a job or you, you, know, you changed jobs or whatever. And next year you see yourself being in a higher tax bracket, then you spend the money next year. But for most people, assuming your tax bracket doesn't change year over year, you're better off uh, getting the deduction sooner than later. So uh, expenses on Airbnbs. We let our clients prepay their tax fees, uh, tax return fees. So it doesn't help me out at all because I have to count that as income for the year before the year's over. But it helps them out because they get to expense their consulting fees and tax return fees sooner. You know, it's funny when you were talking about that last night on the call, Bria uh, sent me a GIF of Blake Shelton going like this. Yeah. But she's literally in my truck right now driving to Banner Elk with like four or five months worth of toilet paper and supplies and linens and all that type of stuff. She's like, see, I do know a little bit about tax benefits. What are some things that people might try to do, Ryan, that they think they can write off or not write off? Or let's, let's just go back to basics. It's December 28th. You know, I'm sitting at home. I, hey, I'm listening to Ryan's podcast. I hear this from Ryan. I hear this on this podcast. Okay, I get on Amazon, I order $1,000 worth of stuff to go to properties. Does it just have to be delivered? Does it just have to be on my credit card statement? Or do I physically have to pay for that? Like, do I need to make a payment to pay for it before midnight on December 31st? What are the logistics of that? No, I mean, for the supplies and kind of the smaller items, it really just has to be purchased before the end of the year. Uh, now, if it's purchased and delivered to the property before the end of the year, that's a lot better than you just uh, shopping on at December 31st, you know, but um, yeah, the rule just says that it's cash basis taxpayers, right? So you, you get to deduct the expense when, when it occurs rather than when you actually may end up using that K cup or that linen. Gotcha. And what about something like funding your kids Roth IRA, um, you know, before the end of the year, there's so many people that don't pay their children that aren't gifting them, that aren't using that money to fund you know, retirement accounts, that type of stuff. Do you recommend anything like that? Yeah, the paying your kids is an ultimate tax hack. I mean, it's one of the best things that you can do because uh, not only does it save you money in taxes, but it can also teach your kid a good work ethic. There's three things that happen when you pay your kids. Number one, 
you're shifting that income from your high tax bracket, your 35, 37% tax bracket over to a lower tax bracket. Assuming your kid doesn't work at all, they can make up to $14,800 and pay nothing in federal income tax on that. Okay. So you're shifting your income from your high tax bracket to them. You get the tax deduction, 37% times whatever you pay your kid. They don't have to recognize it as income. And the third part of the strategy is now that your children have earned income, they can contribute to a Roth IRA because in order to contribute to a Roth IRA, you have to have earned income. Most people aren't going to have earned income until they're 16, 17 years old and they work a normal job. But we could be putting our kids on payroll. We normally recommend nine years and up. Um, anything less than nine, it's really hard. It's going to be really hard to sit in front of an auditor and say that they actually worked in the business if they're not you know, at least nine years old, 10 years old, able to push like a lawnmower or something. But your kid can contribute to a Roth IRA. And the magic number for this is 20000 at age 20. If you can get $20,000 in a Roth IRA by the time your kid turns 20, that alone, by the time they're 60, grows into a million dollars, no additional contributions. So lock away the password, you know, delete the account, don't let them get access to it, because that, that alone will grow to a million dollars by the time they turn 60. Now, that wage has to be fair market value, right? So you said push a lawnmower. What I would tell you guys, you know, our, our, our 10, 11, 12, 13 year olds know more about social media, photography, video, whatever. And the average, so the average freelance social media marketer, you know, is four to $5,000 a month. So you can probably easily get away with $1,500, $2,000 a month if you can prove, if you ever got audited, that they're doing this stuff for you. That's what I did with Gentry, uh, Ryan, my oldest daughter. Um, I was paying her to do all my photography and everything because, and then she won awards for photography and she would help out Chris. She'd come to my boot camps, that type of stuff. Uh, but one of the things too, if people have kids that are over 18, so what I'm doing now is I'm paying Gentry $3,000 a month or 3,500 on salary and having her use all of that money to pay for her school. So she falls in, well, we're trying to get her down to the lowest tax bracket, but also save some money for her Roth and for her retirement and everything. So I give her a few bonuses and stuff like that. But I think one thing that I take away from what I'm doing there and what you say all the time is like, if we're going to start, start, start talking about cost savings, you don't need to lower yourself all the way down to the lowest tax bracket to pay no taxes. Just go from 37 to 24%, right? That's a huge benefit, correct? Yeah, yeah. You're shifting your income from your high tax bracket to theirs. Um, it's even, that's the pay your kids strategy. The cost seg strategy is we don't want to save the most amount of money in taxes one year. We want to learn how to save the most amount in taxes over our life. And the mistake that a lot of investors make is they think that they should just be going down to zero every single year or they try to. You can do that. It's not sustainable long term because you can't sit there with a straight face and say that you're going to buy five properties every single year because uh, we're humans and humans are irrational thinkers. And we, most of us think with our lizard brain. So when those interest rates go up next year, you're not going to be buying five properties next year because you're going to tell yourself it's too expensive. So that's why you have to plan long term when it comes to taxes. If I buy five properties in one year, I'm likely not doing cost seg on all five. Why? Because my tax rate after the second or third one is already going to be lowered super way lower than where I'm at. I'm going to go from a 37 down to a 12 percent tax bracket. I don't want to take anything further. Right. Really, I don't want to go down below a 22 percent tax bracket, if you ask me. So there's um. 37, 35, 32, 24, 22, 12, 10, 0. You really don't want to go below the 22%, in my opinion, because I'd rather have that deduction for next year when I'm back up in the 37% tax bracket. That makes total, total sense. So since you brought up cost seg, we've got a few minutes left here. Let's talk about cost savings. I mean, we're recording this. It's the middle of November. It's probably going to come out the week of Thanksgiving. Somebody could be listening to this in December and say, hey, you know what? I can probably do an all-cash deal, 14-day close, and close on the 26th and qualify for material participation, take advantage of a cost seg. What are the do's and don'ts of that as we are nearing the end of the year? Yeah, if you're going to try to... Remember, everybody can benefit from cost segregation study, right? It's only the people that meet the requirements of material participation that can take the benefits against their W-2 or their business income, right? So if, you, if you're over there, we were talking to somebody in her circle yesterday, I think it was Nicole or Natalie, I think her name was. She already had five properties, five SDRs that were all cash flow. So her strategy really is, let me go buy a property before the end of the year. Um, I need to get it in service and live so I can cost seg it and then offset the other five's income. 
right? But she also doesn't have to worry about the 100 hours for that property, most likely. Exactly, because she's offsetting other passive income. But if you're, if you're wanting to offset your W-2 or your business income, then you have to meet these requirements, right? You have to have two stays of seven days or less. The second stay needs to end on or before December 31st. If you have a stay that goes into the next calendar year, it counts as a stay for that calendar year, not this year. Okay, so you need to have two stays, average of seven days or less, uh, and you need to meet what are, what's called material participation. So that's normally 100 hours in that property and more time than any other person. So your cleaner, your handyman, uh, contractor, you need to have at least 100 hours and more time than the next person in order to qualify. So those are the two requirements if you want to take the tax benefits against your W-2 or your business income. That's awesome. How do I, how do I know? What was the one that you brought up last night? The substantially all. I mean, if somebody's closing around Christmas, if I remember correctly, what you said, and we've talked about this many times, is don't even have the real estate agent, you know, remove the lockbox from when you close. You go remove the lockbox. You do the cleaning. Don't have a cleaner on site. Don't have a handyman on site. So that way, Bill is the only one that's on that property working for the last week of the year. That will qualify, correct? Yeah, there's, so when you look at the, IRS code, there's a substantially all material participation test. So you got, you got the 500 hour test that we talk about all the time. Uh, you got the hundred hour test that we talk about. There's also a test called substantially all. Um, the problem with this is that they don't specifically define what substantially all means. Um, in other parts of the tax code, substantially all normally means 80% or more. When it comes to material participation, I've read, um, I've read audit reports. I've read court cases that are are saying, hey, substantially all means you did everything for the property. You turned it over, you cleaned it, you did the guest communication. If you had anything as much as a realtor come and take the padlock off, you don't qualify. So you had a client you brought up last night that actually like flew to Florida and did the claims twice to be able to qualify, correct? And we lived out of state. They haven't been audited yet, but we're, we're excited if they do to, to try to prove that <laughs> case. Yeah. You might be excited. I don't think they'd be excited. Well, and that's, that's what we talked about. Um, somebody had asked about, uh, maybe it wasn't on the call yesterday, but somebody asked about, you know, riding off boats and jets and all these types of things. And it's like, it all depends on the story that you tell them, that you present yourself. You know, if you go and, if you go and, you know, buy the house and you don't have any bookings at all, or their bookings and it's just Venmo transfers from your uncle, like you're probably not going to qualify because they, they're not going to believe you. Right. So you, you know, you can get away with anything as long as you have a good enough story. And your story needs to be, hey, here's my two bookings on Airbnb. Here's the price. You know, here's the guest communication there. Here's my hours log. It shows that I participated more than anybody else. Here's all my activities. That's your story. So as long as you can tell a good enough story to them, um, you're going to qualify. And it's like trying to buy a vehicle for Section 179 and then trying to depreciate 100%. Like I usually do about 90%. And that was because of John, my CPA. He's like, dude, they're... Nobody's going to give you a hundred percent if you go through an audit. They're going to ask you all these questions. I mean, the thing's parked in your driveway. You can literally tell them you've never driven the truck to the grocery store. No, it's impossible. So I agree with you. That's all great stuff, Ryan. I really appreciate you coming on last minute uh, and doing this. I think the audience uh, will tremendously benefit. You've dropped some really serious knowledge bombs outside of you know hooking up with you at Learn like a CPA on pretty much every social media channel from TikTok, Instagram, Facebook wherever, how else can somebody get in contact with you? Other good place is my Facebook group, Tax Strategies for Real Estate Investors. We got the largest community of real estate investors learning how to save money on taxes. Uh, you could also check out my website. It's just taxstrategy365.com. Awesome. Awesome, Ryan. Hopefully I'll see you in Montana in a few weeks. And uh, man, if you guys have got one ounce of value out of this uh, from Ryan, just make sure you smash that subscribe button and I'll see you guys next week on Bill Faith Unfiltered.